your presence. We hope that you'll look forward to visiting with us and joining us for a fellowship meal after service today. Lunch is all on me today. I'll take you all out to lunch. So you're welcome to attend and join that as we finish up here. Imagine you go to your mailbox and you get a letter and you see the stars and the eagle and you see the seal of the President of the United States on this letter. And it's not addressed to the neighbor in this area. It's not addressed to current resident. It's not addressed to just somebody in this house. This is, has the President's seal on it from the White House, the President of the United States of America, and it has your name on it, and your family's name, and everybody in your household is written on that letter. It's directed to you and your family. What's going through your mind right now? Now this isn't the IRS, this isn't some bad, now this is the President of the United States, somebody of importance, somebody who is, has authority and has influence, and they have sent a letter to you with your name on it. Would it stir up curiosity? Would you be anxious to run inside and open the letter See what it says? So you run in the kitchen, you call the family in, and you say, we've got a letter from the President of the United States. And on that letter, it says to your family with your name on it, we invite you to dinner at the White House. We invite you to come toward we invite you to come see it. We invite you to personally meet me and my family and your family come to this table and share a meal and share what the White House is about. And we want to spend some time with you. There's a table prepared for you. There's a place waiting. You're invited and we want you to come. You're welcome to come. Would you accept that invitation? Would you be excited to go? I'm not asking if you like the current president or not. I'm not asking if you agree with their stance. I'm not asking your opinion. I'm asking, would you accept the invitation? A simple yes or no. If you'll turn in your Bibles this morning, Austin read... For 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. We see a scenario similar to this. Now in these times, there was not a president. There was a king. And in this case, this was King David taking over, beginning his rule as king of Israel. And here, King David is wanting to do something special. King David is wanting to do something different. King David is wanting to do something that normally the other kings had not done. Now, to the president, he may do this every week. He may do this every month. He may do this a lot. But how many times do we go? Right? How many times do we get an invitation? <coughs> And so, though it's special to him for you to come, it's very special for us because we were chosen out of all the people in the country. The president wants me and my family to come and eat with him. You think that just happened by mistake? <laughs> you think that was just something God put a bunch of names in the computer and her name popped up? Maybe so, maybe not. But in this case, it was very direct. And I would think...
think that if it wasn't very direct, it would be one of those letters that says, Open now, current resident, right? We all love those letters, and we open them right then. There's something that's an offer we can't live without, right? And so it's not one of those letters. It's a personal letter designed to you, a personal invitation to come to the president's table, in this case, to come to the king's table. Second Samuel chapter 8, verse 15, we see where David has begun his reign. We see here where David had the authority, where God had already anointed David, and Saul had already been removed, and David is in his kingship. David is ruling. And verse 15 says, David reigned over all Israel, and David executed judgment and justice unto all his people. David reigned over Israel, executed judgment and justice. So David was in this position to handle certain situations and based on what David decided, he had the authority, he had the power to make a decision. He had all the control of Israel at the time. And what David decided to do was what went into effect. Now that can be good if it's used for bad intentions. It can be very bad. But we know that David sought to do the Lord's will. David sought to live a godly man, and so he used this influence to further the kingdom of God. Now this president, I'm not talking about the active president now, this is just the scenario. This president is not a Christian. And you are. And he's inviting you to his table to talk to you about what you believe, to talk to you about what you think you should do in life. What's going to be the topic at the table? If I'm a Christian and someone else is not, then I have a duty. I have a responsibility. I have a challenge. I have an obligation. Do God's will. Second Samuel chapter 9 and verse 1. We get a bit of some background here in verse 1. It tells us what's going on. David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now here we have this shiny new king. Here we have this new king taking over Israel, wanting to execute justice and judgment. A lot of times when this would take place, the new king would do everything in his power and everything in his control to eliminate the first king. To eliminate everything that he had done before, his objective would be to start his own plans and to start his own way of doing things and to start his own legacy, if you will. When you read about in the history books, we just see what? The winners, right? We just see the victorious because nobody wants to talk about the defeats. Nobody wants to talk about bad things that happened. But God made Israel record good and bad. God made Israel record the truth, whether it was good, bad, beneficial, not beneficial, whether they were in control, whether they were taken captive. God made Israel do that. Notice what David wants to do here. That I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. If you remember back 
few chapters earlier, what was the relationship between David and Jonathan? They were what we would call best friends, or what I would assume best friends. David liked King Saul. And David had opportunities to overthrow King Saul, but because he respected him and because he respected God's chosen vessel and because he respected God's plan, David didn't do anything bad to Saul. And not only that, his son was his best friend. His son was his best friend. Now we do things for our friends, right? And we want to help them out. And we want to make sure they're okay. And so David, if you look at it, in this ancient, ancient custom, it was to separate the new regime from everything else that had happened. So David already is doing something different. David is already changing the culture here. David is already making an impact just by the choice he makes. Is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? For his friend Jonathan, we know, was tragically killed in battle, and he wants to honor his friend's legacy. He wants to honor Saul's legacy. He wants to make a change. David wants to show honor and respect where it's due to both his fellow men and to who? And to God. And to the Lord. David wants to have a legacy of being obedient to God. I believe that's a good legacy for us to strive for as well. Verse 2, there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and when he had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, At your service. And then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? David doesn't say, I want them to come to see how great and powerful we are. And I want them to come and see all the things we have. He says, I want to show them the kindness of who? Of God. I'm going to show them the kindness of God. I want to be the representative for the Lord here. And I don't want them to look at me. I want them to see the Lord through me. Ziba says to the king, Is there still a son of Jonathan who is lame on his feet? So the king said to him, Where is he? And indeed he's in the house of Makur, the son of Amiel, and Lodabar. So if you look at the map in the back of your Bible, Lodabar was just a little bit a sub-region outside of Judah, outside of Jerusalem, and it was kind of close to the sea, what we would call kind of swampy land. It wasn't very good to grow crops on the sea where the tide would rise and come in and out, and the water would be at different levels, but there was some suitable land, and apparently this land was for this family. And so the king asked, where is he? He says he's in Lodabar. And then the king sent and brought him out of the house of Makur and from Lodabar. And so he was there. And he was looking for this. He said, I have someone to find. I have someone to search for. I want them to come. But I have to go get them. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, give us a reminder of how we can do this same thing. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us together and made 
made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You see, Ephesians chapter 2 here gives us a reminder of why should we do this? Why should we search for those that need to find the Lord? Because we want them to know Christ. We want them to know God. Why did David want to honor his friend and honor Saul? We see the purpose of his reason here in verse 3. Whom I may show the kindness of God. Brothers and sisters, there's people right beside us this very moment that are looking for the kindness of God. There's people that live beside us, people that work with us, people that we see every day that are looking for the kindness of God. David went to look in Lodabar. Are we looking in our neighborhood? Are we looking in Christville? Are we showing the kindness of God to those who are lost? Those who are lame. You see, we're introduced to someone here. If you're like me, it took a while to try to pronounce it, and I'm, I may still be off, but my best decision was Mephibosheth here. And we're told that Mephibosheth is lame in his feet. He's not the champion soldier of Israel. He's not an award-winning citizen. He's not the ideal person you would think. Guess who God died for? Guess who God sent to the cross? Guess who Jesus went to the cross for? It wasn't the ones already saved. It wasn't the ones already obeying. It was the lost. It was the lame. It was those that we had the opportunity to show the kindness of God to. Are we doing that in our lives? Are we showing them what kind of life they can have in Christ? Are we searching for them? Because a lot of times... They're not going to come to us. As we read on in this story, notice how Mephibosheth reacts. Notice what he says to King David when he's offered the invitation. Going on in verse 6. We see this. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David. He fell on his face and prostrate himself and David asked him where is your servant and David said do not fear for I will show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake I will restore you all the land of your soul your grandfather and you shall eat bread at my table continually you see Mephibosheth was scared he was afraid. He knew the customs. And when he saw King David's soldiers coming, guess what he thought? Oh no. I've been found. Oh no, it's my time. Oh no, David's going to carry on this custom. He found out I was related and it's time to get rid of me. What does the world tell us? What does the world say to those who are lost? It's time to move on. You're not good enough. You're not welcome. You're not worthy. What does God say? You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. You see, my 
Mephibosheth had this thought. And he asked in verse 7, he says, or verse 8 rather, he says, He bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon one such as I, a dog such as I, or someone that is of no value? You, King David, have all this authority and all this power. What do you want with me? I often relate to my goodness yet. I often find myself in his shoes when I see how amazing God is, when I see the world he created, when I see all the things he can do, when I see the stars, and I see the thunder, and I see the sun and the moon and the rivers and oceans. I see children being born and life and spring in this world. Who am I? That you counted me mine. Who am I that you counted me well? Who am I that you want me welcome? John chapter 6 verse 35 Jesus says, there's a seat for you. You're always welcome. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes will never thirst. Jesus says, you're welcome. You're invited. There's a place for you. And he wants to show us kindness. He wants to show us Love, Ephesians chapter 2. God is rich. God is not rich in, in money. God is not rich in monetary value. God is rich in mercy and in righteousness. And because of his mercy, he has so much he wants to share. Who am I? That you would count worth it. Verse 9, the king called to see the Saul's servant and said to him, I have given your master's son all that belonged to Saul and all that's in this house. You and your sons and your servants will work the land for him, and you will bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibba said, Your master's son will eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And so here David has shown his kindness and said it's all going to work out. It's all going to be taken care of. Don't you worry about anything or anything that was wrong. It's going to be restored. It's going to be returned. I find this Again, very familiar. I find this like something that is important to me. I find this in verses like John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, where he says, Mephibosheth, don't worry about all of these things they're taken care of. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Who am I? Who am I to be worthy of your Son? Who am I to be welcome into your kingdom? Who am I? For God so loved. Lord, that's what it means. God says it's worth it. God says you're welcome. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. For when we were without strength and due time, Christ, 
Christ died for the ungodly. Wait a minute. When we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely a righteous man will once die, but a good man, someone would dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love toward us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. I wasn't worthy. I wasn't someone that should be invited. I was lost. I was lame. I was unusable in his kingdom.